faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen is, was not made of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Amen. Hello, everybody. We're going through the book of Hebrews, as you know, and for the next two weeks, we're looking at chapter 11. Uh, we haven't read chapter 10, but in chapter 10, the writer is very concerned about the Christians there because they've been going through suffering and he wants to encourage them not to give up. And so he writes chapter 11. We're going to think about three things today in particular. What is the nature of faith? Uh, looking at some examples of faith and lastly how does faith cause people to live how did it cause them to live in chapter 11 of hebrews and how does that affect us so first of all what is the nature of faith and i'd like to think of three things under that heading first of all it is trusting what we cannot see as we read faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Some people will say to you, they've said to me, you know, we can't believe something if we don't see it. Um, you know, we need to see it to believe it's real. Actually, there are so many things uh, that show that that's not true. You know, physical things, for example, there are many, many things. This Zoom call, for example, I, I don't know how this works. I can't see how it works. I know it works when I press a few buttons, but I don't see it, but I know it's real. Uh, and you could say the same thing for phone signals or Wi-Fi, TV and radio, electricity, wind, gravity, air, x-rays, even things like smell and taste, hot and cold, heat and cold, you don't actually see that. And even the money in your bank account, how many people have seen, been to the bank and actually seen that your money is there in notes and coins? None of us. All we've seen is a little statement on the screen or in our, on a piece of paper on our hands that says we've got so much in the bank. We don't see it, but we know it's there. We believe it's there. What about emotions? Love, hate, anger, jealousy, lust, fear, bravery, faith. You can't see these things, but you know they're there by their effects. And one more, promises. You know, we don't see, when someone makes us a promise, we don't see 
we don't see the thing until the promise is fulfilled but then we see it we know that if someone is trustworthy the promise will come true we believe it even though we don't see it my wife is wonderful at presence and uh, she promised me a, a green screen for my christmas present so that when we do these talks online you wouldn't see this room behind me but we'd have a green screen and so you'd see a lovely scene that we could project onto that and she was very faithful and gave me the green screen unfortunately i left it back in the uk for some reason i'm not quite sure why but you know promises they're not physical they don't we can't get hold of them we can't see them but we do see the results of the faithful person who made them and we receive that now <clears throat> some of you parents may have taught your children uh, to swim i remember teaching our daughter to to swim and going to the swimming pool with her and uh, she would sit on the side i'd try and get her to come into the water to to jump off the side and first of all if you do that you you sit on the wall on the side and then you just roll in and i'd say you can do this i'll catch you you'll be safe and then when she gets a bit bolder you say okay let's stand up and jump in now i'll catch you does she trust you faith involves jumping and uh, it involves taking that little step actually and trusting that the person is going to catch you being confident that you'll be caught and that's pretty hard for adults in terms of swimming isn't it because probably they don't have dad any longer to catch them and to help them and it's harder for them to learn to swim and to learn to jump into the pool than it is for a child and that's similar in faith in some ways because it's slightly harder for people for grown-ups to take that step you don't jump unless you're pretty sure things are going to be okay now you could take this in uh a situation where a man wants to marry a woman and he he knows he wants to ask her to marry him and he knows that uh, he hopes that she will say yes he doesn't know for sure that she'll say yes he'll probably have a good idea because you know they've shared a lot together already he knows that they like each other love each other they've shared goals and interests they have fun together they're good friends but he doesn't know for sure that she will say yes until he actually asks her and he has to take the plunge and say will you marry me but he has confidence in what he hopes for and assurance about what he does not yet see and so taking a step of faith and giving your life to jesus is also a bit like that it's not a blind leap it's a step based on what you've already discovered and that's why something like the alpha course or christianity explored is so helpful because it gives you the opportunity to see the evidence and then make an informed decision and make a step if you want to so take the encouragement of many of us if you've never made that first step into the christian faith take uh, the encouragement to maybe do one of these courses or you know take the step of faith if you're at that point where you can do that and you will not be disappointed as many of us here today will tell you now for christians uh you may be thinking well i made that step years ago yeah but that's fine but the thing is we walk by faith and it's not a one-off experience and when we first become a christian it's something we're supposed to do all the time and so the apostle paul says having started by faith will you then continue with works you know okay that faith bit was for the beginning now i'm just trudging through no did you receive the spirit by faith or works you received him by faith and so as a, as you walk on with him day by day you need we need to be walking by faith now maybe god has been calling you to take a step of faith in some area some particular thing he's been challenging you in and you've been saying i'm not listening <laughs> i don't want to hear that now's the day to say lord yes okay i will do that you know let him come through take the step of faith because you will actually be blessed when you when you obey him and take the step now is the time don't delay so that's the first thing about what faith is it's all faith also we can see gives understanding verse 2 says by faith we understand that the universe was formed at god's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible in other words 
I think everything was made from from nothing god made it and we believe that and it's the faith that gives us understanding in romans paul uses almost the reverse type of idea so he says for although they knew god they neither glorified him as god or gave thanks to him but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened in other words even though they understood at the beginning because they disobeyed and they didn't do what was right they didn't glorify god or give thanks to him their understanding became confused and darkened it's actually you know faith gives understanding and when we don't have faith we we don't have proper understanding and so we make a step of faith and then we begin to see things which have never been quite clear before that's why there's that wonderful line in the hymn amazing grace i once was blind but now i see and there are many things that that are complete mysteries to someone outside of the christian faith which when they actually become a christian become clear and their spiritual blindness is removed the amazing nature of god's love the, the way the bible speaks to us and many other things these things only come as we start our life with god so faith gives understanding and then thirdly faith is incredibly pleasing to god verse six says without faith it's impossible to please god because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Why? Because we were made to trust our creator. And so this restores how things were meant to be. And when we see Jesus' life in the New Testament, he's constantly commending faith, um, doing miracles to pe for people who are sick according to their faith. Of course, when we see the centurion, you remember the story of the Roman centurion who sends people to Jesus and uh, believes that Jesus just needs to say the word and his, uh, his servant will be healed. And Jesus says, you know, even in Israel, I've never found some such faith as this. And then a little bit later, there's that story of the Canaanite woman who he has a, plays a little hard to get with her. You know, and he says, well, actually, I've just come for the Jews. Uh, and she says, yes, but even even the dogs can eat the crumbs under the master's table. And he sees this faith and he commends her, such great faith, he says. And uh, she goes and her daughter is healed. He commends faith. He wants faith. And similarly, he's appalled at unbelief. He doesn't, we're not meant to be unbelieving. We're meant to trust our creator. And so Capernaum is where Jesus lived during his ministry, uh, as was his base. And he says, if the miracles performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. In other words, you know, you can't just see all those miracles and not be moved by it, not be changed by it, not believe in who he is. And he, he says elsewhere, even Nineveh believed. Nineveh was a terribly wicked place but it believed the message that Jonah brought. It's a sin not to believe. How much unbelief do we need to confess? Unbelief is not a pretty thing. It's something we shouldn't have, and yet often we do. And so that's why in chapter three, verse 12, the writer was saying that we have to guard against an evil, unbelieving heart. You know, we start off with an unbelieving heart. We, we get rid of it, but it creeps back we want to keep making sure we don't slip into an evil unbelieving heart so three things about faith they're trusting what we cannot see it opens the eyes of our understanding and it pleases god and then we're going to look at the heroes of faith mentioned in the passage there were five heroes of faith who went before us that we can learn from first of all abel you remember cain and abel abel is gives an offering to god he gives acceptable worship through faith cain sadly uh it gets very jealous and kills his brother and you know sometimes when we discover acceptable worship to god it creates a hostility in old friends and fa sometimes family too so we shouldn't be surprised when that happens uh, but we can take encouragement that by faith, Abel still speaks. He has a lasting testimony, even though he's died. 
And we, when we offer God acceptable worship, we will be doing something that lasts on beyond our lifetime. Enoch is the second one. You may say, who on earth is Enoch? Well, if you read back in Genesis, you'll find out. And here it says in this passage, he was one who pleased God. And in Genesis 5, it talks about Enoch walking with God. We don't know very much about him, but he was clearly someone close to God's heart. The commentator Ellicott says this, he had a life spent in the immediate presence of and in constant communion with God. Now that's a challenge. How about your life when you're with the kids and they're shouting, when you're at work and everything's crashing in on you, when things are going wrong, when you're not well, a life spent in the immediate presence and constant communion with God. We can still have communion with God and talk with him and be with him even in those times. And uh, as our former pastor used to love to say, you know, he walked with God and one day they were walking together and God said, come home to my place for tea. And he disappeared. He went to heaven, apparently. We don't see him again. Thirdly, Noah, in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. Imagine building a boat for decades when there's no rain and no sign of a flood and everybody thinks you're completely crazy. It's not a very nice thing to have to do, is it? It's a terrible thing to have to do. But it says that his faith created in him holy fear. You know, he respected and God was more real to him than all that uh, scorn that he received from everybody else. It gave him the courage to do outrageous things that he would never have thought of doing otherwise. And it can do the same for us. It can encourage us to do things we never thought we could do. And Peter says of Noah in 2 Peter 2 verse 5, he was a preacher of righteousness, warning about the coming flood of judgment. Jesus said of Noah, uh, you know, as it all about his own coming again, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the, in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And, you know, we're called also to warn people that there is a coming judgment, you know, and that's going to cause ridicule. That's the minus side as we live our life before, uh, before the world. It's sometimes we're going to be ridiculed and mocked. Don't be surprised by that. It's part of the the package. The plus side is, like Noah, his family was saved. He became an heir of righteousness. And that's a wonderful thing to hold and as an encouragement as we walk through those times of mockery and scorn. Fourthly, Abraham. Abraham, it says, was called to go to a place even though he did not know where he was going. Have you ever stepped out not knowing exactly where this will lead? Ask yourself. The answer is yes, you have. If you're a Christian, when you decided to follow Jesus, you made that step. You didn't know where that was going to lead exactly. I remember when I made that step standing in a field in the countryside of England, and I made that step when I was 12. I didn't know where it was going to lead. I didn't know I would be here today. I had no idea what that would lead to. But I took the step because it seemed like the right thing to do. What about you today? You know, are you listening to God? Because today he's still speaking and he's still calling us to take further steps of faith with him. We have a, lo a lovely couple of friends called Nathan and Sarah. Um, they are in their late 20s, mid middle and late 20s. He is an architect. She is a an artist. Uh, she has first class degree in languages and uh, they have a nine month old baby. About a month ago they went off to Burundi. If you don't know anything about Burundi, never heard of it, it's a tiny country in the middle of Africa, landlocked, and uh, on most uh, scales it is regarded as the poorest country in the world. In one scale I looked at it said the average income per person is $264 a year. 
Okay, compare that to Switzerland, the average income $81,867, okay, compared to $264 in Burundi. Why would two well-qualified, able young people decide to move to the poorest country in the world in the middle of a pandemic with a baby? What a crazy thing to do. They were called to go to a place, even though they didn't know completely where they were going. They knew they were going to Burundi, but they, there are many adventures ahead of them in terms of what they're going to do as they serve God and seek to share his love with the people in that nation. That's the sort of thing that it will lead you to do. And then fifthly, Sarah. Sarah, it says, was past childbearing age. She was unable to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. Now we can take some encouragement from Sarah because when you read her story in the Old Testament, you find that actually she wasn't quite so faithful at the beginning when she first you know, was uh, challenged about this, but she became it. Remember she was 90 years old, says Genesis 17, 17, and she had hoped for many years she would have a child. For the past 25 years, she and Abraham had been holding on to the promise that never seemed to come. And then God said to them both in Genesis 18, verse 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Yet she considered him faithful who made the promise is what it says here. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. What about you? Do you feel you're too old, too ill, too young, too poor or sad or alone to still be fruitful to still see God's promise fulfilled in you you're not you can see God's promised promise fulfilled in you trust him again confess your unbelief and say again your will Lord not mine and then lastly how did it cause them to live verse 13 says as foreigners and strangers on earth verse 10 says of Abraham again look he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Um, when Grace and I were away on holiday the last few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we decided to reread one of our favorite books uh, and we read it out loud together. It's a book by Lauren Cunningham, the founder of Youth for the Mission, and it's called Is That Really You, Lord? I commend that book to you. If you've never read it or if you have read it, read it again. If you've never read it, you can download it for a couple of dollars couple of uh, yeah that's all it is really uh, on uh, yeah just download it and that uh, is the story of how YWAM began youth with a mission began and all through it he is teaching you how to hear the voice of God so really recommend that voice that uh, book to you and he says uh, after years of marriage living out of a suitcase in tents and school rooms and camps uh, he tells his wife that they are finally going to have a permanent home. It's going to be in Hawaii. And they build, they buy, sorry, a completely dilapidated, rat infested former hotel, which is going to become uh, the University of the Nations. And he says this, we'd been married for 14 years. We didn't even have a car or furniture of our own. Since coming to the Hawaiian Islands, Darlene and I, and the children had moved 18 times, 18 moves in three years. How and why would you live like that? Because you're looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Now, not all of us are called to do just what he did, but many of us are, of course, here in Switzerland, we're actually foreigners and strangers just as it says in the passage. And uh, as we called it in, uh, when we went through 1 Peter last year, uh, as, one, as he calls it, resident aliens. You know, many of us are resident aliens in Switzerland. David Guzik comments about resident aliens. He says they should stand out. And he says the way they talk, the way they dress, their mannerisms, their entertainment, their citizenship, their friends all speak of their native home. If someone is the same in all these areas as the natives, they are no longer temporary residents. They are permanent residents. 
Christians shouldn't get green cards for planet Earth. In other words, this isn't our home. We don't want to put too firm foundations down because heaven is our home. We're passing through here. And, you know, Switzerland is a very comfortable place, isn't it? It's a very nice place to settle down. Let me ask you, have you settled down? Are you no different to everyone else? Or are you, are you still as keen to follow God as you were when you were 18 years old or when you first became a Christian? Are you waiting for just a little more money before you obey what God's calling you to do? Are you waiting for the kids to grow up? If he's called you, he's expecting a response now. That's the type of faith he calls us to. And so at the end of the passage, it says this, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Let us pray. Father, we take encouragement from these verses to trust you, believing what we cannot see, but resting in your faithful character. We thank you for those who have gone before us. Help us to follow their example and to welcome from afar the things you have promised, but we've not yet received. Thank you that you are not ashamed to be called our God for the wonderful future that you have prepared for us. We give you thanks. Amen.